So Ted, are you back? I'm right here. Can you see me? Okay, so I think we ought to get started. Um, here's an interesting fact. I was looking through some material in the library just a couple of days ago, and I came across a book that you wrote. Oh. And it- uh, I, There I, are four of them, so that's- I think right. it's Traveling New England or something like that. New England Notebook? Yes, that's the yeah. one. Yeah, yes. that was my first book. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. Still got it. Good to know. <laughs> and um, so tonight we're going to be talking about baseball and um, other things related to baseball, but more related to society, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, we're welcoming Ted um, Reinstein. Did I do that right? You did. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> to give us a talk about his newest book, which is called Before Brooklyn, The Unsung Heroes Who Helped Break Baseball's Color Barrier. Nancy, before we start, do you have do you have to do something to do the Brady Bunch look on here? Because I can't get everybody online. OK, so up in the very right right hand corner, there's something called view. You can just hover over it. It says view. Yeah, I, I've never had this trouble before, so I don't know. All right, I'll play around with it. I just wondered if you had to do something there. No. Okay, I'll figure it out. On your end. Okay, go ahead. I'll, I'll figure it out. Okay, so um, I am going to mute everyone right now so that um, we don't have a lot of um, noise, like my dog barking or something like that while Ted is speaking. And then after, after he is finished, we will open it up for questions and you can all, since it's, it's a small group, we can um, just unmute ourselves and, and have a conversation. So um, Ted, I would love it if you would um, start and thank you again for coming. Thank you, thank you very much, Nancy. And thank you everybody for joining me tonight. This is a cozy little group, but uh, uh, I appreciate y'all coming out to, uh, to hear me talk about my newest book tonight. So as Nancy mentioned, this is a book that is ostensibly about baseball, but it's really about society. It's really about uh, American history. Um, you know, I did a lot of speaking during Black History Month in February, and I repeatedly found myself reminding people uh, that this is American history. This is not simply Black history, because Black history is American history. And uh, this is one of the foremost stories of that period from the, uh, you know, mid to late 19th century, where civil rights became finally uh, enough of an issue that society finally made some major changes. The plenty of work still to do, but this was really the first major civil rights victory of the 20th century. You know, I always like to start when I, when I do my talk about before Brooklyn, I like to start with this question. I like to ask folks after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, becoming the first African-American major league baseball player, who was the second African-American major league baseball player. And I get all kinds of answers. Generally, I get all kinds of guesses. Some of them sound really like good ones, but they're almost never. In fact, so, so far since last September, I haven't had a correct answer uh, because it's a bit of a trick question. After Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, the second black major league baseball player in America was Jackie Robinson because Jackie Robinson was not the first African-American Major League Baseball player. That's the first misconception we have about our American history. The second is that Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball. He did not integrate Major League Baseball. Being the second Black Major League Baseball player, obviously it had been integrated before Jackie Robinson by Moses Fleetwood Walker. Some 60 plus years before Brooklyn, Moses Fleetwood Walker, who we will learn more about in a moment, integrated Major League Baseball. Third misconception is that when baseball began in its infancy, so baseball begins to grow, the major leagues are born right after the decade or two after the Civil War. The 1870s, 1880s is when baseball takes off in America and when Major League Baseball actually is formed and grows. And in those early days, Major League Baseball, as it grew and it grew 
like explosive growth when it began, it actually looked a little bit more like America, which is to say it was integrated. There were players like Bud Fowler in 1878 who were playing, again, when there was a black ball player on a white baseball team, there was never more than one or two of them on the same team at the same time. But there were, there was no other facet of American life at that time that was integrated like Major League Baseball. It was an outlier. It really was. It really was. Frank Grant, first Major League Black, let me rephrase, first Black professional, did not play Major League Baseball, but the first Black professional baseball player from Massachusetts, from the Berkshires, and most famous of all, the Walker brothers. Moses Fleetwood Walker sitting in that chair at the end of the left in the second row, and his younger brother, Weldy Walker, standing in the center in the rear row. And they were teammates briefly on the 1881 Oberlin Ohio College baseball team. And Moses Fleetwood Walker was the first bona fide black star baseball player, transformed the position, catcher. Before this time, the catcher position was where you would stick your worst player because they didn't have to do anything except stop the ball from rolling off the field. That's all they had to do. So you would stick your most out of shape, slowest, worst hitting, worst player. Boom. Just stop the ball from rolling off the field. <clears throat> Moses Fleetwood Walker completely transformed the position. He's a stunning athlete. He is a great hitter. He can hit for power. He can run. He can run fast. He can throw. He can catch. He's good at defense. So he was good enough that he was signed by a major league baseball team. In 1884, he signed by the Toledo Blue Stockings at the time, a major league ball club. And he becomes, when the season opens in 1884, Toledo versus Chicago, he becomes the first black major league baseball player in American history. And you can imagine that this is reported on at the time as really something of a very uplifting, encouraging, optimistic note in the progress that America is making in healing itself after the Civil War, right? I mean, this is a period of time, 1884 is only 20 years removed, less than 20 years removed from the end of the Civil War, when the country had literally torn itself in two. And now baseball has seen this national pastime, this entirely new thing, <clears throat> is seen as helping the country bind up its wounds. And the fact that 20 years after emancipation, the fact that 20 years after emancipation, a young black man whose parents had been born into slavery, a young black man who had been born when slavery still existed is now flourishing in the national pastime and about, about to become the first black major league ball player. This is seen as a watershed moment in American history. This is seen as proof of reconstruction. Not everybody saw it that way. And unfortunately, one of those who did not see it that way was someone who had an outsized influence when it comes to Major League Baseball, Cap Anson. Cap Anson, this is where the villainous music would, would come in. Because first, let me give Cap Anson his due. He was the captain of the Chicago Cubs, Chicago Cubs are the marquee team of the entire era. They were like the New York Yankees at their best, right? The greatest Yankee team of the late 20s and mid 30s, the greatest Yankee teams of the, of the late 50s and 60s. Think of those Yankees teams. That was the Chicago Cubs in the early era of Major League Baseball. And Cap Anson was the bona fide first superstar of Major League Baseball, slugging first baseman. The Cubs were the team that brought people out to see Major League Baseball. And Cap Anson was the player that brought people out on that team. He was such a good hitter that he still holds several Chicago Cubs batting records to this day, which is extraordinary. All of that is true. What's also true is that Cap Anson was an unrepentant, vicious racist. He was an unrepentant bully, and he had a really foul mouth. And he did not like the fact that his Chicago Cubs were taking the field against Toledo, which fielded a black ball player. He didn't like it enough that he played the game under protest. Further, he informed Major League Baseball after the game that the Cubs would no longer take the field against any Major League team that fielded a black ball player. He routinely used a different word, but you get the idea. So 
the owners of Major League Baseball had to take this threat very seriously. Again, this is the marquee team of the era. This is the marquee player in the game. They have to take this threat seriously. So they meet in Buffalo, New York in the, in the, in the summer of 1887 to decide what to do about Cap Anson's threat. And this is what they did. They acceded to his threat. The color barrier becomes a reality. It is voted in an unrecorded vote with no transcript of the meeting and no one ever taking questions from the press that black ball players will heretofore no longer be offered any major league or minor league contracts. Those under existing contract like Walker will be allowed to play them out and that will be it. The color barrier is now a reality. And players like Bud Fowler would be forced now to leave professional baseball as more and more teams, major league and professionals who were not in the majors at that time, right? So all kinds of existing professional ball clubs that were the minor league teams of the era that fed ball players up to the major leagues and made good money at that. Well, now they're afraid to sign black ball players. They don't want to run a foul, right, of their clients. So players like Bud Fowler, who never played the major leagues, but played all over professional baseball, was now shut out of major league baseball and professional baseball. So we're into the 1890s, and this is the period of Jim Crow. It's important to remember now that baseball is no longer an outlier. For a time, it had been. Brief period of time, it had been integrated. And now baseball is just like everything else in America, from education, to politics, to housing, to business, to sports. Everything is segregated. And it is, you have to remember, this is state-sanctioned segregation. This is not just segregation in, in deepest Alabama, or Louisiana. This is segregation in New York, on Long Island, in New England, in California, in Chicago, everywhere. Why? Because the Supreme Court said so. That's why. Because in Plessy versus Ferguson, a decision that came down originally regarding transportation in Alabama and Louisiana is now made legal all over the country. Plessy versus Ferguson legalized state sanctioned segregation. This is separate but equal, right? Which was always half true. It was always separate, never equal. So now baseball is like everything else in America. And it doesn't matter whether you're trying to play baseball, get a job, go to school, go to college, go to a trade school, or as this picture suggests, which side of the room you're waiting on for a drink of water or catch a train, everything is segregated. But it's important to remember, as we go through the teens and up to 1920, the Blacks never stopped playing the highest level of baseball. Well, not the highest because the highest level of baseball was Major League Baseball and in that they were shut out. But they never stopped playing professional baseball and they never stopped playing a high level of baseball. Some of the Black barnstorming teams of the teens leading up to the 20s were good enough to beat major league teams and they often did and they often did they just were not allowed to get to the highest rung of baseball which was major league baseball and you can understand that that was something that a lot of great black ball players of that period of time right the two decades from the fall of the color barrier or so up in 2 1920 found it intensely frustrating that they were not able to get to that final rung of baseball, Major League Baseball. And one of those who felt that most keenly was Rube Foster. Rube Foster was the first real star black pitcher. He played on several great black barnstorming teams like the Chicago Giants. Um, and he decided that when he retired, he was going to do everything he could to create an elite level of play for black ball players. Yes, he understood that blacks would not be allowed to play in the major leagues, but as he said, there's nothing they can do to keep us from playing in our own major leagues. And in 1920, in Kansas City, Missouri, Rube Foster founded what that would be, the Negro Leagues. The Negro Leagues are the single most significant unsung hero in the entire saga of the struggle to break the color barrier, because without the Negro Leagues, there would never have been the showcase that would have been, was necessary for whites, not blacks. Blacks came out and watched the Negro Leagues from the day they were born. They were already watching the players for the previous two, or two and a half decades who became Negro League players during the, the teens, right? They were already, they, they knew who these players were. 
the Negro Leagues will become vital because it's the showcase that over time, whites will become familiar with the level of play that's going on in the Negro Leagues and will ask themselves, why? If these guys are this good, can't they play in the major leagues? And they would be reminded every time they asked themselves that question, why it was they couldn't play in the major leagues, the color barrier. So the Negro Leagues are born and the Negro Leagues take off. I want to draw your attention, by the way, let me put my cursor right here. Um, see this guy right here? This is, so here's Rube Foster. This is the founding of the Negro Leagues in February, 1920. This gentleman right here, J.L. Wilkinson is the owner of one of the most iconic Negro League teams in the Negro League history, the Kansas City Monarchs. And J.L. Wilkinson will be the only white owner of a Negro League team in the entire history of the Negro Leagues. And I don't raise this right here just as a you know, racial peculiarity. I raise it because there is a direct through line, 25 years straight shot from the day that photo was taken to Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier because J.L. Wilkinson will be the Negro League team owner who signs Jackie Robinson to his first professional baseball contract. And then it will only be six months until Robinson breaks the color barrier. So the Negro Leagues are born and the Negro Leagues take off. The Negro Leagues take off because the level of play is that good. Players like John Pops Lloyd, Judy Johnson, and a decade or so later, Oscar Charleston, one of the greatest fielding ball players in baseball history, James Cool Papa Bell, arguably the fastest human being to have ever played baseball. And it looks like the Negro Leagues will have the same explosive growth that the major leagues had in the 1870s and 1880s. They're that good. They go from 18 teams to 26 teams, enough teams to separate into a Negro American League and a Negro National League, enough to have the first of two Negro League World Series. And it looks like the sky's the limit for the growth of the Negro Leagues. And it might have been. It might have been. The sky instead hadn't fallen in because the first decade of the Negro League's explosive growth, the 1920s, ends in 1929 with, of course, the Great Depression. And, you know, I sometimes think that we forget just how cataclysmic the Great Depression really was. I really do. I think sometimes we forget, for instance, you know, we've had periods of times in over the last decade where unemployment has actually been technically under 1%. In America, even now it's under 3%. During the worst years of the Great Depression, 30, 31, 32, 33, unemployment in many American cities was over 25%. That meant a quarter of all Americans were out of work. And in minority communities, flip that. In many minority communities, unemployment was three quarters, 70% <clears throat> or more, only a quarter working. And in the worst years of the Depression, 32,000 or more American businesses going under every year in the first years of the Great Depression, including the Negro Leagues, gone, up in smoke. Now, <clears throat> you might wonder how many major league teams were going out of business. After all, every all 16 of the American major league teams at that time uh, were each in and of themselves thriving American businesses. And if 30,000 or more are going out of business every year, why wouldn't one or two major league teams go out of business? But as you can see, not a single major league team went out of business. Now, there's a good reason. The Negro League teams were owned by people who may have had some money, but they were not generally hugely wealthy. And they depended on slender lines of credit from black owned banks only. White owned banks weren't lending money to Negro League teams and black owned banks went out of business during the Great Depression. But all 16, of the then major league teams at that time, each one of them was owned by a fabulously wealthy owner. For instance, the Boston Red Sox were owned by Tom Yawkey. Now, I don't know if you remember what you got on your 16th birthday. Tom Yawkey came into $16.3 million. And five years later, he came into the rest of his trust fund and came into 16.3 more million dollars. Uh, and he bought the Boston Red Sox. Now, just to give you a sense of, of proportion here, Tom Yawkey was a relative pauper compared to some of his fellow owners at that time. We mentioned the Chicago Cubs. Chicago Cubs at this period of time were owned by a guy named Phil Wrigley. Phil Wrigley had a little chewing gum business going on in Chicago. St. Louis Cardinals were owned by um, <clears throat> Augustus Bush. He was brewing a little beer out there in, uh, in St. Louis. 
they were fabulously more wealthy than Tom Yawkey, so they were insulated. And none of the major league teams went out of business. And one single Negro League team also managed to stay afloat. And we're back to our friend J.L. Wilkinson, who won the Kansas City Monarchs, who you see here. <clears throat> so J.L. Wilkinson was determined to keep his team afloat, uh, even as all other businesses were dying and even as the Negro Leagues themselves uh, died. And uh, he, he, he said to his club that I really would love to keep you guys on payroll. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is to keep playing baseball pretty much year round. And that's what they did. Uh, he outfitted for his team a special custom made bus you see here. They were able to eat on it, sleep on it and travel here. They're barnstorming through Canada in one of the lean years early in the depression. But they couldn't have kept doing that forever. Uh, and fortunately for, for, for him and the Monarchs and the Negro Leagues, he didn't have to keep doing it forever because wonder of wonders, the Negro Leagues are reborn. And this is really one of the most single, most extraordinary events, I think, of the entire period of the Great Depression, certainly of this story, because the Negro Leagues will be reborn in the early years of the 1930s, right? So the worst years of the Depression. And they're reborn in the American city with the highest unemployment rate of all, Pittsburgh. So two completely counterintuitive elements behind, in and of itself, an extraordinarily unlikely event, the Negro League stirring back to life. <clears throat> and they do it solely because of these two men who are extraordinarily sort of un un unlikely figures of their own um, first of all, you're looking at two lifelong arch enemies. These two guys hated each other and they couldn't have been more different. Um, other than the fact that they were from Pittsburgh, other than the fact they were both men, other than the fact that they were both black men, other than the fact that they like sports, that that's it. That is it. Uh, come Posey, come Lynn Posey Jr. Uh, son of a pioneering black figure in Pittsburgh. Um, one of the first, um, licensed certified uh, civil engineers, black civil engineers in Pittsburgh, and he founder of two or three very successful black companies. And I'm sure he had hoped that his young son, Composey Jr., would follow his footsteps into the business. But uh, Composey Jr. had different ideas. He was a sports fanatic. Uh, he loved basketball, which is a relatively new sport then. Uh, and he loved baseball. And baseball won out partly because he was approached in the late 1920s um, about saving a legendary black ball club in Pittsburgh. They were known as the Homestead Grays. Homestead is a section of Pittsburgh. And the Homestead Grays were kind of an old time famous team, black baseball team. And he agreed to purchase the team and coach them, manage them, promote them. Um, and it turns out that he had tremendous baseball skills, coach, manager, promoter, most importantly, it seems, though, that his greatest skill um, was in inspiring and motivating young Black athletes. How good a job did he do? Well, in his first year leading the Homestead Grays, Cumberland Posey Jr. and his Homestead Grays of 1931 went out and had the greatest single season that any baseball team of any era any city, any country, any color has ever had. No team, not the Yankees, not the Dodgers, no team has ever had a season remotely approaching the 1931 Homestead Grays. 143 wins. Let me put that in some context for you, okay? So today, Major League Baseball plays in a 162-game season. At that time, they played only 154 games. The Homestead Grays themselves won nine less games than the entire season for Major League Baseball. There are today three Major League Baseball teams. Today, in 2022, there are three Major League Baseball teams today. I won't name them to embarrass them. There are three that over the last five seasons have not won cumulatively 143 games. So that's the season the Homestead Grays had in 1931. 
But remember, I said these guys were arch enemies. So not to be outdone, Gus Greenlee decided to try to outdo Composey's incredible season in 1931. So completely different story with, with, with Gus Greenlee. Uh, grows up in Pittsburgh, uh, hard scrabble youth, one of six brothers, goes off to fight in World War I. He's wounded at the Battle of Verdun, decorated, comes back, has to find a job. It's the depths of the depression, the depths of prohibition. Can't even buy a drink to drown your sorrows. And he decides he'll cobble together enough money to buy a cab, right? Drive a cab, one man cab company. Okay, so he does. He drives an old jalopy around Pittsburgh. And he's approached one day by a fellow who says that he represents the Latrobe Brewing Company in Pittsburgh, PA. If that name is familiar, that's because Latrobe still exists and it still brews Rolling Rock beer. But at that time, they were brewing beer um, undercover because this is prohibition. The legal beer is, it's, you can't brew beer legally, right? So the guy approaches him. He says, hey, look, pal, we're looking for somebody to drive our, boot, uh, our bootleg hooch around town and we need somebody to drive it. And he says, um, oh, okay, uh, well, um, I already have a job. And the guy says, yeah, I can see. He, uh, he says, what's the most money you've ever made driving cab? And he says, I don't know, uh, maybe nine or 10 bucks one day. And I says, all right, I'll tell you what. Why don't you multiply that by 10 for your first week? If things go okay, multiply that by 10 for your second week. And then uh, if things keep going okay, we'll keep multiplying by 10. What do you think? And Gus Greenlee said, uh, when do I start? And he took the job and never looked back and never worked an honest job the rest of his life. Gus Greenlee was a crook with a capital C. Um, you name it. Uh, I mean, look, they were, it, was, it was all gambling crime, right? But you name it, running the numbers, you name it, he did it. This guy wasn't driving that car very long. This guy was into his own stuff in short order and at one point was making $20,000 a week in 1932. That would be like making $5 million a week today. That's the kind of money he was making. He opened up his own jazz club, which, by the way, is its own story because the Crawford Grill in the Crawford section, the Hill District of Pittsburgh, the Black section of Pittsburgh, is a famous story in its own right. Google it. It's very interesting. It was a mecca. It was a jazz mecca. You name the jazz great. Ellington, Basie, Billy Holiday, Ella. They all played the Crawford Grill. He's approached about saving another great Pittsburgh Black ball club at that period of time, and he decides he will buy the team. Um, if he can change the name to promote his jazz club. So the Pittsburgh Crawfords are born. And one year after his arch nemesis, Gus Composey wins 143 games in 1931, Gus Greenlee's Pittsburgh Crawfords win almost 100 games in 1932. How did he do it? Same way he did everything else in life. He stole it. Um, how did he steal it? Well, Direct your attention to the rear row, okay? Let me use my cursor again. This guy right here and this guy right here, both were stolen from his enemy's ball club, the Homestead Great. When I say stole, he enticed them away with more money. And by the way, these two guys made an entire career out of poaching each other's best players all the time. But in this case, he had poached the two best players in not only Negro League history, but two of the dozen or so best players who've ever played baseball. This tall guy right here is a promising young pitcher by the name of Satchel Page, one of the most legendary ball players in baseball history. The guy standing next to him was a promising young slugging catcher by the name of Josh Gibson, also one of the best players to have ever played the sport of baseball. Page would go on to play in the major leagues and really be one of the most colorful players in the entire history of baseball. Gibson was much more retiring, much less colorful, much less given to talking that much. He was a very shy kind of guy, had a kind of high squeaky voice and uh, let his bat do the talking. And it did. Uh, he was known even in his playing days as universally as the Black Babe Ruth. And funny story, shortly before his playing days ended, Josh Gibson, Josh Gibson, there he is catching. And there's, there's Paige. Josh Gibson met the real life Babe Ruth. And Babe Ruth threw his big meaty arm around Josh Gibson like he liked to do. And he shook him a little bit like he liked to do. And he said, Mr. Gibson, what an honor this is. Hey, I understand they call you the Black Babe Ruth. What do you think of that? 
and Josh Gibson in his little squeaky voice said, Mr. Ruth, my people call you the white Josh Gibson. What do you think of that? So these two guys will do more than any other figures in this entire story to help break the color barrier. And they do it without even attending a demonstration or carrying a black card. They do it because these two players will become so overwhelmingly popular among blacks and whites who both blacks and whites see in these two players, two of the greatest players they've ever seen play baseball, even in that period of time, that they become walking advertisements for how wrong the color barrier is. Now, you have to ask a question here. How do we know so much about the Negro Leagues? I just shared all these anecdotes about Satchel Page and Josh Gibson and Cool Papa Bell and Oscar Charleston. How do we know so much about the Negro Leagues if you consider there was never a time in the entire history of the Negro Leagues that a single mainstream white newspaper assigned a single beat reporter to be a dedicated reporter covering the Negro Leagues, not the Negro Leagues as a whole, not one team specifically, ever. So how do we know so much about the Negro Leagues if the white press never followed them? The black press. And the black press, second to the Negro Leagues themselves, are the second most vital unsung hero in breaking the color barrier because it's the black press. Listen, the Negro Leagues are the most significant unsung hero because they were the showcase that showed, again, mostly whites. They showed whites that black players were good enough to play in the major leagues. But everybody wasn't going to games. So it was the black press that was reporting on those Negro League games, reporting about how fast Cool Papa Bell was, what a hitter Gibson was, and what a pitcher Page was. That was the black press. Pioneering publishers like Robert Lee Van of the Pittsburgh Courier, greatest distribution of any black newspaper in American history, just slightly more than Robert Sengstack Abbott's legendary Chicago Defender. And they hired legendary black sports writers like Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey, who presented these players like Page and Gibson as these three-dimensional figures that had never been done before. And it made all the difference. Again, not the Blacks. Blacks didn't need to be told by Wendell Smith or Sam Lacey or anybody else on earth about how good Oscar Charleston or Judy Johnson or Satchel Paige was. They knew. They were going to the games. Whites who weren't going to the games needed to begin to read about players like Satchel Paige. Who is this guy? who I, I read here in The Courier, I read that this piece has been picked up by the New York Times, written by this guy, Wendell Smith, who was at the game at Yankee Stadium in 1939, where Satchel Page struck out the great Joe DiMaggio three times, only time in his entire career DiMaggio struck out three times. Who is this guy, Satchel Page? That's how important it was. That's what the Negro press was doing. But how are they reaching these readers? Second question, how are they reaching these readers? You can write all the stories you want, but if you can't get your newspaper out to newsstands and out to places where people can get your newspaper, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Your paper just sits there buried and nobody reads the story. The single most unlikely unsung hero, the single most unlikely. The Negro Leagues and the Black Press were the most important unsung heroes, but the Pullman Porters were the far and away, the most improbable, the most unlikely unsung hero in the entire story. It's the one I knew nothing about, and it's the one I couldn't read enough about once I found out. So the Pullman Porters, as you may recall, or you may know, were the face of overnight train travel in the heyday of rail, 20s, 30s, 40s. And the Pullman Porters were also the birth of the black middle class. They were an exalted position in the black community. These were well-respected men. Now, on the trains, to most whites, they were servants. That's what they were. They were they were rolling rail servants on the train. They showed you to your berth. They carried your bags. They showed you to your dinner. They turned down your bunk. They gave you a wake up call. As that guy said, well, of course, at that time that would have been a wake up knock. But um, those pioneering Negro League publishers, Negro paper publishers, they saw in the Pullman Porters an incredible ally if they could only be recruited to the cause. The cause being 
getting their newspapers circulated all over America because these publishers saw in these Pullman porters a black figure that did something no other blacks in the 1930s were doing. No, most whites weren't doing traveling all over America. And they thought, hmm, if they could somehow be allied to our cause of getting our newspapers out and people could read the stories of Wendell Smith about Satchel Page and the, why we need to break the color barrier. They didn't need every Pullman porter. They just needed one or two on every train route, you know, going down the Eastern seaboard or out West or up North or down South. And they did. They managed to recruit enough Pullman porters and they did. They were allies in the cause. They were always completely hidden allies. Look, what were they doing? They would take on black newspapers in cities across America. These guys were also involved in provisioning the trains, working the kitchens. They would have food arrive in bread trucks and food trucks. And at the bottom of the bags and baskets and boxes, there would be black newspapers. And the trains would take off and they would run down the eastern seaboard from Boston and New York to Baltimore and Philly and on down to Miami. And on those trains, there would be these black newspapers and they would offload them in various cities and take on more black newspapers. Any one of them would have been fired on the spot had they ever been caught, but they never were. So by 1939, there were times when you might have a better chance of finding the Pittsburgh Courier on a newsstand in Seattle or Miami or Fort Worth, Texas than the New York Times. And in this way, the consciousness began to be raised all over America about the color barrier still existing in 1940. Now, we're up to 1940, and it's important to point out, so we're up to 1940. So we're less than 10 minutes away from the end of our story and the breaking of the color barrier, because that's, spoiler alert, but that's how the story is going to end, right? So how do we get there? Major League Baseball was no closer to dropping the color barrier in 1940 than it had been in 1930 or 1920 or 1910 or 1900 or 1890 for that matter. So what happens? Well, in a nutshell, what happens is that the decade of the 1930s ends the same way the decade of the 1920s ended, which is to say with another national and more international cataclysm, World War II. And in New York, which before this time was not a hotbed for the, for the breaking the color barrier, but it becomes one, Lester Rodney is the first person, a sports writer, and he's the first person who will frame the argument for breaking the color barrier in the context of World War II. And he does it this way. So Lester Rodney, by the way, is nobody's profile of somebody who would be trying to break the color barrier. First of all, he was in New York, which as I said, was not a hotbed for breaking the color barrier. He was white, he was Jewish, he was a communist. Hey, nobody's perfect, okay? But he was also a gifted sports writer. And in the late 1930s, he would have written for anybody, but he happened to get a job with the American Communist Party and their Daily Worker, their daily newspaper, because in the late 1930s, the Daily Worker launched a sports section and they needed a sports editor. And Lester Rodney got the job. And he loved baseball. He was a gifted writer, hated the color barrier. And he begins framing the color barrier within the immorality of the following, which is that he would remind viewers that America is going to war. And at this moment, as he would remind people, blacks as well as whites are training to fight and they will be going off and they will be asked if necessary to die for their country. And those who come home who are black, will have just been asked to die for their country and yet return to a country where they're still second-class citizens, unable to sit where they want on a bus, unable to vote in many places, and unable to play Major League Baseball. So this begins to resonate in a whole new way, in a way it never did before. In fact, a Pittsburgh Courier picks up on Lester Rodney's argument and they create what they call the double victory campaign to help Black servicemen going off to fight with that anguishing choice uh, to fight and perhaps die for a country that calls you a second-class citizen. 
And they launched the Double V campaign. Double V campaign, double victory. And what it said was, look, double victory. First go off, defeat Adolf Hitler, come home, defeat Jim Crow. And that handkerchief, which the Pittsburgh Courier distributed for free, was worn in the jacket sleeve, the bomber jacket sleeve of every member of the Tuskegee Airmen, which is the most celebrated all black unit in World War II. But for this story, it is not the most relevant all black unit. That honor would go to the 761st Tank Battalion. The 761st was the first all black armored unit ever. Uh, it fought with Patton's Third Army, set records for consecutive days at the front, one of the first units to cross over into Germany, one of the first units to liberate a death camp. But most importantly, this little inset picture right here, most importantly, the 761st was led by a young lieutenant named Jack Roosevelt Robinson. Jackie Robinson got his lieutenant stripes in 1942 at Fort Riley, Kansas, and was transferred to Fort Hood in Texas in 1943 to help take command of the 761st. And he could not wait to lead the 761st into combat in Germany. Didn't get there. The 761st did but without its young lieutenant. Because just before the 761st was set to disembark for Europe, Jackie Robinson flunked his final physical. He had been a All-American halfback at UCLA football. Old injury reared its head. He was clear, not cleared for combat. He asked for special permission to go with the unit nonetheless as a special morale officer, request denied. Jackie Robinson was crushed, said it was the biggest disappointment at the time of his life. Uh, the unit ships out. Jackie Robinson decides to leave the hospital, go back to the base, get a drink at the Black Officers Club. He gets on a bus that's circling. Fort Hood is an enormous base, one of the biggest in the world. Bases, buses constantly circling the base. He gets on a bus <clears throat> and he takes a seat right behind the bus driver, front row. He does not want trouble. He knows there doesn't have to be trouble even as the bus fills up with white passengers when he knows he will be expected to go to the back of the bus. Because Jackie Robinson knows, and the bus driver may well not have known, that 48 hours earlier, President Roosevelt has signed an executive order prohibiting, prohibiting segregation on transportation within domestic American military bases. So Robinson actually knows he has a right to sit wherever he wants on that bus. Driver does not know, may not have cared. Bus fills up, tells him to go to the back of the bus. Robinson refuses. Bus driver pulls over to a sentry post. Two MPs get on the bus, handcuff Jackie Robinson. He's let off the bus. He's arrested, court-martialed, insubordination. Now, in person, I would ask for a show of hands how many people know that Jackie Robinson was ever court-martialed. No hands ever go up, and there's a good reason for that. Because if Jackie Robinson had been court-martialed, and had lost and been dishonorably discharged from the army, you would never have heard of Jackie Robinson. Seriously, think about that. The name Jackie Robinson lost to history because Branch Rickey would never have been able to pick him to break the color barrier. But Jackie Robinson beat the color barrier, beat the charge. He beat the court martial. He was honorably discharged from the army. Now he needed a job in the spring of 1944. So he writes a letter to our old friend, owner of the Kansas City Monarchs, J.L. Wilkinson, and he asks him for a job. He said, I know that some of your best black ball players are still returning from Europe. And I'm wondering if you might be able to give me a tryout to play for the Monarchs this year. And J.L. Wilkinson says, Jackie Robinson, I know who you are. You don't have to try out for me. You got a job, report to spring training in Houston, sir. And he did. And Jackie Robinson reported for spring training, and in short order, the final battle of the color barrier will be fought in Boston. It will be lost, but the war will be won. So Jackie Robinson breaks camp in Houston with the Kansas City Monarchs, returns to Kansas City for opening day, 1945, April. Again, I would ask for a show of hands if we were in person to ask you, how many know that only three weeks from the day this picture was taken that you're looking at, Jackie Robinson would not be in Kansas City, but in Boston, trying out for the Boston Red Sox at Fenway Park. 
because at the same time he's posing for this picture on opening day in KC 1945 in Boston, Izzy Muchnick, a Jewish Boston city councilor, is instead focusing on how he can force the Boston Red Sox to hold some tryouts for black ball players. He has been very moved and touched and persuaded by Lester Rodney's arguments about the color barrier and how it must fall now in the context of World War II. And Muchnick sits on the Boston City Council, the second Jewish Boston City Council, who would go on to become the first chairman of the Boston School Committee. And Izzy Muchnick is an observant Jew who lives by something that in Judaism is called tikkun olam. Tikkun olam translates from the Hebrew literally as repair the world, and Muchnick lived by it. Jews are asked during their lifetime to perform tikkun olam, repair the world whenever you can. It doesn't have to be gargantuan. If you bring soup to somebody who is sick, if you offer a kind word to someone who needs it in a moment of need, that is repairing the world at that moment for one person. Much Nick did his eye on something much bigger. He really did want to try and break the color barrier. And he was desperately looking for a way to have leverage with the Boston Red Sox. And in April 1945, he found it. He found, you know, Massachusetts used to have these archaic things called the blue laws. They're mostly gone now, but, um, but they still existed. You know, until less than 20 years ago, there was still a blue law in the books of Massachusetts, which forbade liquor being sold on Sunday in Massachusetts. That's the kind of laws they were from the Puritans, fun people, the Puritans. So there was still the one on the books in 1945 that stipulated that you could not play Major League Baseball in Boston on a Sunday, the Lord's Day, without the, ex the, the unanimous vote of the Boston City Council. Izzy Muchnick realized, wait a minute, I'm on the Boston City Council. All I have to do is withhold my vote. Sox can't play baseball. Time to play ball, hard ball, and he did. He wrote a letter to the Brain Trust of the Boston Red Sox, and there you're looking at him. There's Tom Yawkey right here. There's his general manager, Eddie Collins, his manager, Joe Cronin, both themselves in the Hall of Fame. Uh, and this tall guy here, Eddie Collins, his general manager, got the letter in which Izzy Muchnick appealed to him to hold a tryout for some qualified black ball players. And Eddie Collins, Eddie Collins had no intention of holding a trial for black ball players. Uh, that wasn't going to happen. He didn't say that, but he did say, look, uh, in all my tenure with the Red Sox, Mr. Muchnick, my esteemed Mr. Counselor, there has been zero interest from any black ball players in playing for the Red Sox. So what can I do? Uh, Izzy Muchnick understood when he was getting a load of you know what. So he waited and he waited and he waited until a week before that vote was to take place to allow the Red Sox to play baseball on Sunday. And he sent the cablegram back to Eddie Collins. And he said, Mr. Collins, it appears you have no interest in holding a trial for the Boston Red Sox. And therefore this cable should serve to inform you that I will be withholding my vote for the Red Sox to play baseball on Sunday this year. Well, that got Eddie Collins attention, needless to say. And he ran to Tom Yonke's office and they realized they had to try to appease this guy. So they wrote back and they said, fine, we'll have a tryout. Three, three, that's it. Three black ball players. Have them at the ballpark at 11 a.m. Gate D, April 12th, 1945. And there is to be no press, they said. And Muchnick grudgingly agreed. Now, Izzy Muchnick knew a lot about Boston politics and order ordinances, but he did not know much about black baseball. So he consulted with Wendell Smith of the Pittsburgh Courier. And Wendell Smith picked out three, what he thought would be the leading candidates to get a tryout for the Red Sox. Uh, Marvin Williams, a young outfielder named Sammy Jethro, and a promising young infielder in KC named Jackie Robinson. <clears throat> and they trooped to Boston and they were all set to try out. And it didn't happen. Because on April 12th, 1945, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt died. And America shut down. No trial. 24 hours later, America began to open back up. 48 hours later, America was fully reopened. But the Red Sox seemed to be still in the throes of inconsolable grief. Can't have the tryout. Well, obviously what they were trying to do was run out the clock and they almost made it. 
two more days. Two more days was all they needed to do because on the afternoon of April 16th, 1945, the Red Sox are scheduled to catch a train to New York where they will open their 1945 season on the 17th at Yankee Stadium. But on the morning of April 16th, 1945, a white sports writer in Boston breaks the story. He breaks the story on the front page of the Boston Traveler and he informs his readers that you don't know it, he says, but he writes, but at this hour, there are three qualified Negro baseball players who have been marooned in a hotel room for over a week, having been promised a tryout by your Boston Red Sox, who are now trying to renege on the deal and skip town. Well, the Red Sox knew they finally had to have a damn tryout. So they told Muchnick and Smith, get those players over here. They did. They trooped over to Fenway Park. They suited up. They took the field. They ran the bases, took some infield, took some batting practice about 45 minutes later, called off the field. The three of them were thanked very much. They were told that the Red Sox will be in touch. None of them ever heard from the Red Sox their entire lives. But one man was paying rapt attention that morning, April 16th, 1945, was paying rapt attention at the Brooklyn offices main offices, Brooklyn Dodgers main offices on Montague Street in Brooklyn Heights, because that man, Branch Rickey, already at that moment had a plan in place to sign Jackie Robinson for over a year now. And he was suddenly terrified that Tom Yawkey might go ahead and upset his plans. Now, in retrospect, we know that we could have reassured Branch Rickey that uh, it'll take Tom Yawkey another 14 years to break the color barrier, but Rickey didn't know that. And so six months later, right after the season ended in 1945 for Jackie Robinson, he signed Jackie Robinson in Brooklyn, New York, right there to a minor league contract for the Dodgers top team, top minor league team, the Montreal Royals. And then two years, almost to the day of that sham tryout in Boston, Jackie Robinson would take the field at Ebbets Field in New York, in Brooklyn. Wearing number 42, and I'm, I'm reading to you now from the last page of my book, wearing number 42, as he strode out to his position at first base, amid the din of cheering fans, of broadcasters announcing history and of exploding flashbulbs capturing it, there were also two inaudible sounds at Ebbets Field that day of a wall falling and of a cheering that could not be heard with the ear, only with the heart. It rose from those not present physically, but spiritually. Those who could not be seen, but were there just the same. Moses Fleetwood Walker never lived to see it. And by the time he died, broken, bitter, alcoholic, he couldn't even imagine it, but he was there. Bud Fowler, who had tried his entire life to outrun the shadow of the descending barrier at every turn, a black man who had desperately wanted to just play baseball as long as he possibly could, and now he was in Brooklyn. Even as they worked their regular shifts that historic day, on their way west or south, some of them rolling along the rails less than a mile from Ebbets Field, the Pullman Porters, who had seen to it that those stories of people like Jackie Robinson and Moses Fleetwood Walker had reached people all over America. They were there. And the black, the Negro leaguers past and present, those who had come too early and those who were now young enough to imagine that they too might now walk through that wall. They were there. And the African-American veterans of the wars just ended and those who had given their lives in it, they were there. On this momentous day, a ball game was played before a crowd present and cheering and another crowd silent and unseen. They watched a game and they watched a terrible wrong being finally righted. To be sure, even as a black ball player bounded onto an otherwise all white field, racism was still alive and well in Brooklyn and clear on across America. So many other barriers remained in place. Many sadly still are. But on this day, some of the hurt and the humiliation were salved. On this day, Hope and faith that had long seemed to have run out were finally redeemed. On this day, the long arc of the moral universe seemed to bend improbably toward Brooklyn. 
touching down on the grass and the dirt of a creaky old ballpark where the familiar white lines would no longer bar a black ball player. And in the bottom of the seventh inning, when Jackie Robinson laid down a perfect bunt and raced toward first base, he was not alone. That invisible crowd was suddenly right there, running right alongside, willing him on. And as Robinson sprinted safely onto second base and caught his breath, they exhaled with him. After all, it had been a long, uncertain journey, and they had helped him get there. The next Dodger batter doubled. Jackie Robinson rounded third, and he was home. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll invite Nancy back out if she'd like to join us for the q and I'm happy to take any questions. If anybody has a question or two, I would be happy to answer it for you. And I'll tell you what, let me leave this slide up because uh, if we were in person, I would have a table with some books. So if anybody would like to purchase a book, all you got to do is go to my website. I'll tell you how to get a signed copy of the book. I'll even ship it to you at no extra charge. So there's my email address. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions anybody might have. Uh, you can all unmute yourselves. I think we're just going to have a little conversation. Yeah, sure. Um, and, you know, I actually have a question. How, how segregated were the fans, mm. the audiences? It, how segregated were they? Good question. Good question. That's a great question, Nancy. I, and I, I, I sometimes get asked that, and I'm always glad I do because it, it's important. We're talking about black ball players being segregated, but it's important to remember that ball parks were also segregated. So blacks were not barred from attending major league games. Black ball players were barred from playing on those teams, but major league ballparks were segregated. So there were areas of major league ballparks. They were almost always out in the outfield and, and some of the worst seats. Those were black sections where they were forced to sit. Now, curiously, Negro league parks were never segregated. Blacks were free to sit wherever they wanted at any Negro league ballpark. But thank you. That's a great question. And did many white people go to the black ballparks? Another good question. So early on, no. So early on, when the Negro Leagues begin, uh, right after 1920, um, they are almost entirely uh, blacks coming out to these ball games. But word begins to spread so quickly about how good some of these players are. Players like Judy Johnson and Oscar Charleston and Cool Papa Bell. These were extraordinary ball players. They would have been able to play on any major league team. And by the late 1920s, as, and as the Negro Leagues take off again, listen, you have a team like the, the Homestead Grays that win 143 games. That's reported on. So by the mid-1930s, people in Pittsburgh are flocking to see the Homestead Grays, whites included. And funny story, Nancy, you know, people in Pittsburgh, don't forget, Pittsburgh was home to the Pittsburgh Pirates a legendary major league team. I grew up in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so I don't have to tell you about the Pirates. And you might also know the joke that I'm about to tell you. The joke in Pittsburgh in the 1930s was, Blacks and Whites, was Pittsburgh, home to two great ball teams. The Pirates aren't one of them. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. The Pirates were terrible in the 1930s. So. <laughs> Smoke City, but the... Uh, the Pirates weren't considered one of the one of the three great play baseball teams. Any other questions? No pressure. I, I got another question. Yeah. I'm full of questions. <laughs> I love it. How long did it take you to research this book? <sighs> you know, I when, whenever I'm asked that answer, I, I, I would say, listen. How long did it actually take me or how long do I wish it had taken me? Because I, I, obviously I love history. I love researching because I love being in libraries. I love libraries. And it, that is one of my absolute favorite things in the world to do is hole up in a, in a, in a great library for an entire day and research. Um, and I love baseball. So I, 
I would have been happy to have devoted a decade to researching this book. But unfortunately, as you probably know, if you want to get a book actually published and put out there, uh, you have to at some point finish a manuscript and get it to the publisher. So I have tried to do that with all of my books within two years, um, because you have, you have to surrender an entire third year uh, just on the publisher's end once the manuscript is delivered. So I try to you know, do the research and the writing and all of it in less than two years. And that's what I did. But I would have, lo I would have loved to have taken longer. Believe me. Believe me. Well, I know, I know it's a cozy crowd, so I don't want to. I, I just wanna, say yeah. that I appreciate hearing the history of how, I think I knew that there was black people playing in the, after the Civil War, somehow I knew yeah. all of that connection mm. from the 80s and 90s up to Jackie Robinson, who was my man. He was mm. my favorite when, I, when Dodgers were still in Brooklyn. Oh. When they went to Los Angeles, I lost interest. Uh, but, so did a lot of people in Brooklyn. Yeah. And he was the guy that I just thought was so brave. And then when I read about the way he was treated, having arrived at that place, you wonder if ever he thought it was great because he was just treated worse than a dog. He, he was, I'll tell you what, because we're a little small group here, let me take a second. Let me, um, there it is right behind me. Give me one second. I'm going to share something personal. With you. Okay, while you're looking at you, oh, he can't hear. So anyway, I was going to you. say that I finished, I was yeah. curious to see how you trace the history from the man who, had, who was managing that one team and sponsored him 20 years later yeah. for him to finally get to be the right. man to start. And yeah. I, guess, I don't think I ever really thought about that many other people who right. would have been connected that he didn't just come out of nowhere. You mean um, Jackie Robinson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, he... He didn't, and uh, the reason I got up, I, I mean, I excuse me, I got up because I wanted to share this with you. So you're talking about Jackie Robinson's your man. Jackie Robinson has been a lifelong hero of mine. And this photograph here uh, was given to me by my dad uh, when I was 12 years old. In oh. fact, this penny that is still scotch tape to, with the original scotch tape, honestly, this should be an advertisement for scotch tape. It's yeah. the original scotch tape from 1967 and it is a 1947 penny which was the my dad picked out of his pocket and said hey look what i got a 1947 penny you should tape that on that picture that's when jackie broke the color barrier and it's still there i still have the picture and my point being jackie robinson is a hero for the ages um i think there were moments you're absolutely right i think there were moments during the summer of 1947 when jackie robinson wondered why was this ever going to be worth it? Because he went through what no human being should ever go through uh, oh. in terms of the abuse that he went through that summer. Um, but in terms of where he came from, so, you know, what's interesting and what I go into in detail in the book, you know, we were talking about the Negro Leagues, we were talking about some of these early black ball players. I, I have to tell you that, that when Jackie Robinson only played in the Negro Leagues for for a single season, uh, just under a single season, players like Satchel Paige felt that it should have been somebody like him who had been picked, who had really paid their dues, riding yeah. those rickety buses and sleeping on the floor in flea bag hotels in the Negro Leagues. He felt like those guys paid their dues, those guys. So that's the fuller picture, right, of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier. There were other black ball players who felt as much as they understood, he really had the profile Ricky needed. You know, um, there, was, there, were, there were those who felt like it, it maybe should have been somebody else. But J.L. Wilkinson, who was the owner of the Kansas City Monarchs, he is responsible really for putting Jackie Robinson in position to be signed by Branch Ricky because he knew Robinson needed a job. He didn't make him do a tryout and he gave him a job. And by the way, um, years and years later, the Dodgers, then in L.A., finally compensated 
J.L. Wilkinson more than the $3,000 that Jackie Robinson was, was sold for, which was nothing. Um, and they finally paid more money years and years later to, to, to the Kansas City Monarchs uh, for Jackie Robinson. Anyway, we went off on a great on a, on a big tangent, but that was a good one. Thank you. I don't have any question, but I find found this very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that very much. Can Listen, I have I, more yeah. question? Yeah. I see now that you have your four books up. I'm looking at the general stores of New England. Mm. Where, where did you go to find those general stores? Oh, uh, so I've been reporting around New England for um, 25 years, and I've always loved general stores. So <clears throat> I have visited general stores in all six New England states and many other general stores around the country. So uh, I've been in, in many, many general stores, but for the book, I chose about 40 that really in many different ways uh, told the story of why general stores matter so much in American history, uh, not just New England, uh, not just commerce either, but what they mean in terms of the, 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 the creating community in a lot of small towns around uh, New England. So, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that, was, um, that was a lot of fun research too. <laughs> visiting, visiting some of my favorite places. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, those are great, some of the best questions I've been asked, in, in, seriously. So- I have I, one I, more question. Yeah. How long did the Negro League stay? How long did they exist? Yeah, how long did yeah. they keep playing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So about 45 years. They are born in February 1920. And by the end of the 1960s, Nancy, they're gone. Uh, by 1970, there are no Negro League teams playing any longer. And most of the Negro te League teams that hung on in the 60s were playing largely as barnstorming promotional teams like the Indianapolis Clowns, uh, the Newark Giants. Um, but by, the, by, the, by 1970, they're gone. They're gone. Yeah, I remember as a kid hearing about the Homestead Grays. Sure. Yeah, greatest season any team has ever had. Unbelievable. Um, 143 games. Really just amazing. Amazing. So, hey, look. Um, Fascinating <clears throat> program. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, sometimes the coziest ones are the best. Yeah. So, um, Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you coming out. Nancy, thank you for your help. And I, I hope I'll have an opportunity to, to speak to the Milford Public Library again sometime. Oh, I hope you will too. This was absolutely a fascinating evening. Thank, thank you, you Nancy. So much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Be safe. Bye-bye. 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 Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks for coming. <laughs>